What's up, Spell Slingers? My name is Gary and John Wells. I'm Drew Flitton. And I'm Corey Janabagian. And this is Untap, Upkeep, Drink. Beer up. Welcome back, guys. Today we are continuing the Oktoberfest Brewers Weekday 3. We're talking, we, we talked light beers, we talked dark beers, we're venturing into the funk, we're going full on sours today, and we've got a very special guest. We've talked about him before Corey's roommate <laughs> and your brother, <laughs> and my brother, Sean Wells. What's poppin', boys? Hey. Oh, so, I think you've definitely got the most mentions on the podcast, yeah. so it's only fitting that we finally got, got <laughs> you on to talk about some stuff. And specifically, we brought you on because, one, you're probably the only person in our group who's like specifically net-decked, which is what the sub-theme of this episode is, uh, but also you're the sour drinker of our group. You're the guy who, if you find a sour, you're probably going to pick that over probably anything else, right? Yeah, which is ironic because I'm the only one not drinking the sour today. <laughs> Yeah, so Gary <laughs> kind of touched on it that we're drinking the funky beers. So we group sours and other beers that just don't belong into that category. Right. So we're talking about the beers that are kind of outside of the what we've arbitrarily claimed are light beers, dark beers. Uh, we've got like uh, the sours, obviously, sours and gozes. Sorry, gozas, as I think it's technically supposed to be called. Uh, aged beers, chocolatey beers, like things that you've added more than what a normal beer is, consists of. All the good stuff. And weird stuff. So before we really jump in too far, uh, we've got to dive into the beers. Okay, today I'm running with Funkworks Raspberry Provincial Sour Ale Brewed with Raspberries. So our friend Nikki brought a bunch of Colorado beers, and this was one of them, and I held on to it just for this episode. So I, I haven't tried this one yeah, yet. I was going to say, didn't drink any of them. I, I've had it in my fridge for a month here at the studio, and I've been tempted several <laughs> it, it times. It looks so good. The color is incredible. It looks like grapefruit. Yeah, it does. It smells a little bit sour. I'm diving in. Immediately, you're hit with just crisp tartness. And then you get a little bit of raspberry at the beginning, and then it just mellows out into just your standard ale. Yeah, the nose is real sweet raspberry. It's got a lot of bitterness on the end as it's sat for a little bit. It definitely smells super sour. Yeah, it's really it's actually though. not as tart as I thought it would be yeah. by the smell. The smell's actually way stronger than the taste. It's almost not watered down. I don't want to say it like that, but it's super thin. Yeah, that's what I was going to uh, say. It's fresh. light and thin. Yeah. yeah. It's refreshing, though. That's yeah, a good beer. It's really not that sour. Yeah, it's really it's not good. super tart. Once again, one of those ones that the bite is worse than the bark or whatever, reverse of, of that. Yeah. So today I am going to be crushing the 10 Barrel Brewing Company's Crush Apricot Sour. Um, and shouts this one, out. I go there out. every time I go to Boise. Ten barrel? Ten barrel. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> Get a new These sour are... every time. Yeah, so Sean and I have actually had this one. We've tried oh, as many of the, the crush cycle as we could. Wow. And this one's up there, yeah. I I think we're venturing in the territory where Drew starts to find the tartness overbearing, maybe. We'll see. But it's very sour. Apricots kind of have their own bite anyway. Um this one's 6.2% alcohol and 18 IBUs. Um, it kind of shows. I mean, it's not bitter at all, which is typical of a sour. It's refreshing. Very good. Uh, there's some sweet tones, but overwhelmingly sour. <laughs> very good. So definitely sweet up front. Turns into what I would say is more classical of a sour. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of has that like acetic acid kind of vinegary taste to it yeah it's i was gonna say sean immediately smiled after taste so yeah that's the kind of sour i like has a lot of pungentness yeah a lot of that like drew was saying that vinegary burn kind of taste. Not so much of a burn is just kind of like that it's just acidity to it yeah. it's the the pucker quality yeah, the like a warhead in a sour i really really enjoy it yeah all right so went back to almanac with this one uh we've got the strawberry basil sour nova it's part of their barrel age series uh this one looks wild. Yeah. So, this naturally conditioned mixed culture sour ale was aged for months with 100% real strawberries and organic Thai basil, creating a delightfully tart and refreshing brew with light herbaceous notes. So, I'm a massive fan of basil. When I saw this can, I said, 
This one's mine. I don't care. <laughs> you fight me for it. Basil on a pizza is my favorite thing. So I'm a massive fan of the word herbaceous. <laughs> herbaceous. Ooh. So smells like a sour. Tastes like strawberry. Light. And they do say light herbaceous notes. Can confirm. Uh, just a little bit of the basil. Thai basil is not always super strong anyways, and that's kind of what I'm getting out of it. To be honest, it smells awful to me. <laughs> really? Does it? What does it smell like? Just kind of, I don't know. It's kind like of like funky? a funky sour. It kind of smells like spit. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, and it's uh, it's not very sour. It's, no, I can it's definitely not. taste the herbiness. It's like tart strawberries and a little bit of basil. Okay. Got that basil. It definitely smells a little funky. It kind of <laughs> smells like a, a Belgian style ale. One that we've had on yeah, before. Yeah, a little bit more. Just like that, that. that kind of Funk. rotten fruit kind of smell. <laughs> so in a good more way. of like a natural fermentation kind of thing. To be fair, it was like a natural condition in barrel with strawberries and basil. Yeah, I like that. Oh, the, yeah. You get the strawberry right at the beginning. Yeah. And, then just, and it's a it nice flows. sweet, but light, light tartness to it. Into this. Yeah, I mean, there's the no good way to say it, but it is like a bacteria kind of smell. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I just like that it's aged for months how how many like most of the time they're like we got nine months aging here you know we're proud of this uh i think it's just aged in oak barrels so it's you know got i'm tasting it a second time it kind of has like a, a woodiness just very light it's not like super heavy uh but i'm down all right sean what do you got i got a beer from the top of main series out of wasatch brewery it's called the english style barley wine ale and uh, it's aged in Pinot Noir bottles, Ooh, and it says it's a uh, yeah Pinot Noir barrels. Barrels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't slept all night, so there you go. I'm gonna sound weird today, <laughs> boys. Uh, we'll so just we cut got ninety percent like of Sean's stuff. <laughs> so we got ten point four percent alcohol. Oh, God, damn. <laughs> so it's pretty uh pretty strong. Seems uh no IBUs uh, that I could find at least anywhere. Yeah, I think that that's kind of common with some of these offshoot beers like sours don't often like Corey what was your percentage the I looked it up and it was a 4.2 percent alcohol by volume but, but the IBUs, IBUs and aren't Gary, listed. you had to look for a while to find IBUs on yours yeah. mine's 5.5 percent but again IBUs aren't listed so it's not uncommon to see they're kind of like ciders yeah not so kind of I'm gonna dive in yours darkest of the bunch incredibly dark for what I it thought looks it like was a gonna quad. be yeah. yeah yeah it's really dark it's, it's like a scotch of, really murky like a brownish red. Smells like a wine barrel, mm-hmm. which might not be a good thing because I'm not much of a wine guy. So we'll see. Uh, yeah, ironically, we gave Sean the wine. <laughs> yeah, we, we brought on the sour guy, <laughs> he's and he's, sour. he's had most of the sours. And I was like, I found this almanac, and I was like, I'm not giving this to you. Sorry. Yeah, I hadn't had a sour beer until I started drinking with Sean. And then he's like, have you ever tried a sour beer? I was like, no, what is that? And it changed my life. <laughs> yep. To be fair. We Who have- turned you onto those? It was a Pete Tadlock. Oh, shout I out. fucking knew it. <laughs> So what's this one like? So this one, back to the wine ale. It definitely tastes a lot like wine. Um, I mean, I like it better than just drinking a bottle of wine. So that got something going for it. But I wouldn't drink it every day, that's for sure. Yeah, it, it smells a lot like wine, but it doesn't have that tartness that wine has. But to me, it kind of tastes like Fig Newtons. In a weird, weird way. Could be it's, good, could be bad. It's got that sweetness that figs have. We all know I like figs. It's it's interesting. I don't no, think I've had a beer like now that. Now that you say it, it smells like figs. Yeah. I think the big thing is it doesn't have that dryness that yeah, red that wine has. Yeah. yeah. How bizarre. It's very, like, dense. It's rich. You know? Yeah. It smells like that. The aroma is like, it's like a, a really dark red wine that... It's like using a, a red wine for a reduction to me. Yeah. Like it has that kind of almost like syrupy candied sugarness to it that after you've reduced it down a bit. Yeah. And then you just get the strong punch of alcohol through it. Yeah. It's definitely a barley wine. Ooh, I can feel feel the alcohol more than I can actually taste it, which is probably better. All right. So let's get into our first topic here. Uh, I realized once we had gone through talking about light beers and dark beers that we never actually talked about the difference between ales and lagers, which is, I think, the first thing we kind of touched on in the last episode, talking about Cranko and dark beers, was that uh, we're talking about amber specifically and how there's lagers and there's ales, but we never actually talked about what the difference is between those two. And that's kind of like one of the major distinctions of categorizing beers is whether they're lager beers or whether they're ale beers. And the difference generally is the way that they are brewed 
specifically the yeasts that they use. So ales are top fermented and lagers are bottom fermented. Uh, more importantly, the yeasts and the temperatures for that fermentation are different. So they use different types of yeast and different temperatures to create that bottom and top fermentation. Right. So with ales, because they're top fermented, the yeast kind of sits on top uh, for the most part of the fermentation cycle and it makes alcohol th- through that process. Whereas lagers, they have, I don't know if it's just a more dense yeast or whatever, but it generally sits closer to the bottom. Uh, I think towards the end of its cycle, once it, it dies, it'll float up to the top. Uh, but for the most part, it should be closer to the bottom. But that also means that if you have a lager uh, and you drain the yeast, it, because it settles to the bottom, you're able to drain the yeast before the rest of the, the beer. Or you can uh, have your drain higher so that the yeast sits at the bottom. And you can actually drain out and have the yeast just chill at the bottom the entire time. Yeah, so ales are usually fermented at warmer temps and then lagers are on the colder side. And because of this, the the colder fermentation, it gives the these lagers just a... A crisper, fruitier type of beer. Yeah, it, it results in a smoother beer overall because it's had time to like settle and the yeast does all of its work. But yeah, so like the the old story on uh, making lagers is that uh, they would make beer and to store them over long term, they would take them up to like mountaintops or wherever and they would store them. I think it was like four degrees C is the article that I was reading. And some of the yeast would continue to ferment and there's like yo what's going on here this is different from what we're used to uh but by storing them for you know three months or whatever it was uh to keep the beer fresh and then they bring it back down and it had just a completely different flavor palette so like yo we got something here let's keep doing this and so we started to get lager and then uh world war ii came around and we've kind of told the story about like sessionable beers but lagers really kind of took the boom at that point in time and we started to get more consistent lagers and breweries really started to kind of dive deeper into what it is to make a lager and lagers just became like the most common beer type just because of the way it was made you could make it lower uh, alcohol point you could sell it and a lot of the breweries were kind of merging together and so like the breweries at least in the u.s started to narrow down to less than 100 or something like that uh and so people were just strictly drinking lagers because that's just what everybody made yeah. it was the way to store beer make like these clean refreshing uh not overpowering the flavors aren't going to be obtrusive in any any way and so it wasn't until people were like well what happens if i do want a beer with more flavor like 1980s 1990s that you start to see the start of what we have now is the craft beer boom with so many different ales that just have these amazing potent flavors like everything we're drinking right now is probably an ale style beer from ale yeast and it these uh not necessarily richer but these more uh yeah complex and unique flavors really come from ale style beers I mean, it, it might sound like a bold statement, but I feel like lagers and lagering is sort of the opposite spectrum from sours in that lagering uses those cold temperatures to keep away anything weird and funky and c- kind of slow things down and clarify. Whereas sours, as we're going to get into, generally are let go a little bit. You know what I mean? That's kind of where the origin of sours is from is just these beers kind of getting a little bit of extra yeasts or bacteria that sort of were at were at first uncontrolled you know the first beers a lot of them were probably a little bit sour on accident because of you know poor sanitization and stuff um and so in a way they're kind of opposites of each other in the way that in what they do and don't allow to happen during the the process all right so i thought we were talking about sour beers here guys (laughs) it is the reason that we brought sean here so uh i guess Corey or sean you guys are the guys who drink the most sours out of us. You guys, anytime we have a sour on, it's probably Corey who's drinking it. Gary, you've kind of come into the sours, although I'm trying to lure you over to the dark side. We're trying here. Uh, one of you guys want to give just a kind of a, a general description of what sours are, why you like them? Well, I'll give you a non-scientific description. <laughs> I expected just, that, yeah. <laughs> they're very pungent, very strong, literally very sour. Um, how else would you describe it? They, uh, we kind of brought this up earlier, but that's sort of just acidic nature to them. It's not necessarily vinegary, but just that burn that a lot of them have. That yeah. you, you, if you've ever had kombucha, yeah, or anything fermented like that, a lot of fermented drinks they just get this aftertaste of just sourness. Like there's really no other way to describe it. Yeah, usually, and it always seems like a, such a negative, but to me, and. Gary, and you talked about your, your wife, how she has the same description, is that it kind of has this like bile acrid taste to it that yeah. just turns me off like no other. 
See, and I like to add lime and lemon to everything that I drink. Just oh, yeah. See, even but water. to me, that's a completely different taste. The yeah, acid but I quality think of that is like a bright note, whereas a lot sure. of sours are not necessarily. But I think just the nature of enjoying tartness is, uh, I think that's one of those things that, for the reason that I like sour beers and maybe you don't, you know what I mean? And maybe it's just one of those things that hits different to the mouth. But to me, what really sticks out about sours is that pucker factor. Because a lot of times when you drink a beer, you get sort of the sweet note or the savory note uh, and sometimes the bitter note, which is sort of the dry side. But the sour is like the wet side. It makes you salivate, literally like wets the palate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, a lot of people that I've talked to about sours have either never tried them, absolutely love them, or absolutely hate them. Yeah. And I think it's just one of those things that if you don't like that puckery, just bileness that Drew and Gary are saying, then sours just aren't for You're you. You're just probably but not going to like me. See, I, I, I like sour things and I like them. you know things that make you pucker, but this has a different quality altogether. And I'm sure it's, some people- It's because it's more of a bacteria lactic type acid. Yeah, it is a lactic or like acetic acid flavor. Yeah. But I think a lot of people were probably thinking- you know, oh, they did light beers, dark beers. And because Drew writes most of the episode, he probably like cut the sours out. He doesn't like them. They're not doing them. <laughs> uh, not the case. Um, also, they have kind of a, a unique quality in that they have these colors and textures that are so dependent on the actual ingredients used. Right. We've got a lot of fruit, uh, fruity style beers that come out of them. Uh, it depends on like the fruit, the sweetener. Sometimes that is the fruit itself. Sometimes it's a different sugar or like uh Every once in a while, it's a malt, like a barley yeah. wine. Uh, then the filtration or lack thereof, the timing that these things are done. Like the beer that I'm having, they literally just stuck it in a barrel for some a couple months. Who knows how long? They'd, some amount Some of amount months. of months, yeah. <laughs> with strawberry, which is a sweetener, but also has that tartness to it. And then they just kind of let it go sour and I'm not going to complain. No, it's great. Yeah, if you just look up pictures of sour beers, their colors are incredible and or, they're all over the place too. to check out drew's brews we'll have eight different sours on hopefully by the time you're listening to this and the range of colors those are all distinct sour beers and they go from a very light beer all the way down i burned my palate out doing that <laughs> just tasting as many as i could yeah they're just there's i think they're just some of the most photogenic beers yeah. and i i love them all right so we talked about specific categories uh from craft beer they have their descriptions and the details. Corey, why don't you go ahead and start us out? Okay, so we grabbed these from craftbeer.com. It's that website that we've been using that is just an incredible resource if you need to know anything about beer. And first one we've got is our sours. And we have the American Sour IBU varies, but it's usually on the low side. Like the one that I have isn't listed. And mine was 18. Yeah, they're just often super low. Like the bitterness is just barely even there or just non-existent. Yeah. And then with that, you have with the that, ratio. We have the, our BUGU ratio, which just says varies, and our SM, which says varies. And so the we've talked about the colors. It could be all over the place. And then the bitterness to sweetness ratio, which is the BUGO, it's they can just, some are on the sweeter side and some are on the more bitter side, but they always have that just acidic nature to them yeah so what we've got here is the acidity present in sour beer is usually in the form of lactic acetic or other organic acids naturally developed with acidified malt in the mash or produced during fermentation by the use of various microorganisms now usually we don't like reading straight from the from the book yeah but since this is such an involved process and there's so much science and fermentation and things you can't really mess around with I think just taking this book definition is the best way to do it. So a lot of these beers, they just, like, as we've been saying, they just take these bacteria cultures and form those flavors. And so because of that, you can literally make any flavor profile that you want. You can use any kind of fruit or any weird thing that you want. I've had gin and tonic sours. We've had... One of the ones that I've got on Andrew's Brews today is a gin sour. Was wild. I have to like read into that one because that one was interesting. I have a couple buddies that I grew up with in Idaho that aren't aren't magic players, but they just enjoy some of them like easy drinking, you know, Bud Light, Coors Light kind of beers. And it was a hard sell when you try to tell someone, well, this beer is 
uh, it's fruity and it's fresh, but it's been soured by bacteria. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard when you go the technical route, but that really is how they make it. Um, but it is done in a controlled way. You know, it's, we're still talking about very, very small amounts of quote unquote spoilage that just creates these really good funky flavors. Yeah. And I, we've had the cucumber crush on this before. <sighs> uh, I reviewed the raspberry crush. Yeah. For one Sean and I have had, we've had hibiscus crush. You guys said you had a, or a, We've had an hibiscus sour. You guys said you had a passion fruit sour. You just you can last take anything time I was at Ten Barrel last month. I had a vanilla honey sour. Oh, oh man, goodness! <laughs> See, like even not even fruity flavors. You can just just take any profile you want and just culture it and get yeah. just some funk that is just incredible. All right, Sean. So that's sours, but there's another style or variation on beers that we hear about. It's the kind of salty version. All right, so this one's called, uh, they're called Gozas. Um, yeah, every time if Corey and I like to debate, is it Goze, Goza? I think it's supposed to be Goza, but it's spelled G-O-S-E. Goze. It, it's really weird. Yeah, it could be, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the technical uh, definition of it, it's stratum medium amber in color. The contemporary Goza is cloudy from suspended yeast, a wide variety of herbal, spice, floral, and fruity aromas. Or fruity aromas. <laughs> I, I don't think you throw all of that in there. <laughs> you could try it. Uh, yeah, so herbal spice floral fruity, fruity aromas other than found in traditional Leipzig-style gosa are present in harmony with other aromas. I think it's interesting that they have listed the IBUs typical in these beers, probably because they are marked not as a sour beer companies are more apt to put an average IBU. And so they're saying, you know, 10 to 15 is normally kind of the range that these fall into. This the, is specific for the contemporary goes and not for right. any of the other varieties. Yeah. And then the BUGU scale tip in the way that I like 0.27 to 0.28. So very far on that not bitter ratio, you know, we're, we're going more in the acidic and sweet tones. Mostly because there's almost no bitter. Um, and then the SRM is three to nine. So like Sean was saying, the straw to medium amber, a lot of times they're not going to be real dark. A really good example of a goza that we've had on the show is the Anderson Valley Frambois goza. Uh, and it was a raspberry rose goza. Uh, that was a delicious beer. That one was really good. I, I really like Anderson Valley. They have a lot of really good sours. Yeah. So basically summarizing sours, we've got really tart beers we've got real good funk to it it's all coming from sort of a a soured mash and these cultures that sort of create new flavors i think if we were to put out a message like we've talked about drew doesn't really love sours as a general rule but that doesn't mean he doesn't try them he tries them on the show he's found i'll try any beer once yeah and he's he's found several that he likes even though he doesn't typically like a sour so that's what i want to get out is that you know, when you first start drinking anything that's gone sour, you don't want to try that. It seems scary. It seems weird and gross. But I definitely think, especially if you have places like we do in Idaho that give out tasters, just, you know, pull the trigger a couple times in a year and try some new sours. You might just find the cucumber sour is one that I've given to so many guys who don't like weird beers. And they've all said, holy hell, this is good. Like just try some beers, try some sours and just see where it takes you. Yeah. I think it's more of an acquired taste than most beers just because it's easy to take one sip. And it's like, Nope, Nope, this isn't for me. But yeah. once you get into them there, the breadth of flavors you can have is just so wide and varied that I'm always on the lookout for just new and weird sours. All right. So let's diverge away from the beers. Even though it's brewers week, we're going to talk about net decking. Sean, this is the, the real core of why we brought you online. What is net decking? What does that even mean? This is like a direct shot at me. Okay. I'll say that there is like a super stigma. negative stigma. Yeah. A really bad connotation that goes along with net decking. But I think you're probably the only person who has literally like followed the definition of what net decking is. And well, and I think our group in general has always been totally fine with partial and or full net decking. You know I mean? If you find something you like and it's already really good online, there's no reason you should be like, oh, I have to change that because someone else has already done it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. There is there is a community of people who frown upon it, but... 
Before we get into all that, Sean, what is net decking? Net decking is just going online and finding someone's deck list and buying those cards verbatim. Exactly. Yeah, so a lot of people, they just, when they make a deck, they use these software or programs that you just put cards in, you can look at your stats and all these things, and you just post them for everyone to look at. Although, I will say, I think it's disingenuous for people to shoot down just net decking in general, because I don't know very many people who don't visit EDH Rec and see what goes in a commander. So, that's one of the things that, okay, so before we get into that, I'm going to get ahead of myself if I don't keep this rolling in the right direction. Uh, so net decking in competitive formats, you're taking like the best decks, right? Because right. before there wasn't a lot of decks being posted. Deck stats is still relatively new. Tapped out's only a few years old. Uh, all of the like actual deck publishing websites weren't there, right? So people would see these top eight deck lists and those are what people were building from, right? So they're already successful in tournaments and things like that. And that's what people are saying. Like the championship standard right. or modern decks. And so decks. the idea is with net decking is you take that list, you memorize it, you practice it, and you learn how highly skilled players play that. Yeah, and so some old examples are like Affinity deck. I'm just going to look at the Affinity deck. I'm going to get all those cards. I'm going to play that deck. Or like Primetime. I'm just going to get the Primetime deck list. Oh, these are the best cards for Primetime. I'm going to play that deck. Yeah, and so this is where I want to bring out what net decking is not, right? These are the misconceptions. Right, looking at cards online is not net decking. Guess what? The internet is our best resource. We're going to use it just because you're looking at cards online. You probably don't have access to them otherwise. It's not like you can just go to a shop and look at every card that's ever been printed to make a deck from. You could uh, building and testing your decks online before actually buying a deck. Right? That's not net decking. You're using the internet to build a deck, and with like deck stats tapped out, you can like goldfish them, which is where you just like take practice draws and see how the the, the deck is going to play out. Again. Just because you're using the internet as your resource doesn't make it net decking. That's not what we're using as definition. I don't think that's what most people use as the definition. And like I just said, using online resources to evaluate cards and archetypes, such as using EDH Rec, which Gary was uh, mentioning there, MTG, Goldfish, any of those things, again, that's not net decking. The idea of net decking is that you take most of the functional cards of the list. right? So like, to that, I will disagree to some percent. Because evaluating cards online, I get, is is substantively different. But taking a commander and looking at them on EDH Rec, not just evaluating the card, but finding the most commonly played cards, I think still fits in the net deck category of this is what people play because this is what's best. And so in essence, you know, the, the naysayers of net decking are going to say, you didn't make that decision. You just looked at what was best. I think there's a very fine line between playing staples and playing exact deck lists. Because, yeah. like, obviously, if you're ru- running green, you're going to play Cultivate and Kodama's Reach. And, like, most decks are just going to have that. And just because you're playing a mono green commander doesn't mean that you're net decking because you're playing those things. Yeah, and so I think a yeah, I lot think of a lot of cards are going to be the same, but that's just the nature of magic. You're naturally going to play the good cards, yeah. and everyone's just going to do that. I think that's a better way to say it. Thank you, Corey. Uh, so let's look at some pros and cons. Sean, you've had, like you <laughs> have already alluded to, some negative, negative side of things. You've seen it a little bit. Well, I think my personal opinion is I think that anybody who has a problem with net decking is just wrong. It doesn't make any sense at all, especially with like the reason I net decked my first net deck is because I've never built a combo deck before. And if I would have just went out and tried to build a combo deck, even with EDH rec, I guarantee you it would have been absolutely awful. All um, right, so let's look at what are the the cons. What are, let's do pros and cons. Let's do con, cons first, just because I think there's way more pros than what people give it credit for. I personally see zero cons. <laughs> I, I really, like that. I'm being completely serious. I don't see any cons in net decking. All right, Corey, personal opinion. generalized. Let's look at some cons. So... We've already talked about it, but it's often looked down upon, but it doesn't matter. Like, Sean has his deck. He doesn't care. He made the deck. It's his deck. And some people will say that you can't show who you are if you just net deck. But, again, Sean showed that because he's one of those guys that even if the deck is garbage, he still pimps it out. He makes all of his matching lands. He plays as many promos as he can. Like... He See, to me, I think puts when you flavor go, in there. Yeah, when you go to net deck, you literally start searching for your personality. You know yeah. what I mean? When I first went in and said, I want to build 
a dredge deck. I've never played dredge. I didn't play modern. And so I was like, well, how do I even do this? You know what I mean? What cards do I do? This fits my personality. I know exactly what dredge does. It fits everything that I want to do. I'm just looking for the way to make it effective, the way to do it right. And that's what I think is the, the big, well, we'll get into pros, but I think that's one of the big pros is that, you know, the naysayers will say it's lack of creativity or something like that, but all of us magic players are resource focused, right? Yeah. We're, we're efficiency focused. Yeah. You can experiment and maybe that makes you this creative brewer, but why would you waste a bunch of money <laughs> trying to find a car? You know, oh, yeah, that card didn't work. This card didn't, you know, we'll get into is that, yeah. like, I mean, I hadn't honestly thought of like, you look for the deck that fits your personality, which is totally correct. But also if you're like net decking for a specific competitive deck or something like that, then you're doing that because that's part of your personality. You want to be competitive. You want to win. win. That's yeah. part of who it is. And like for Sean, like you started to get into combo decks literally because you're like, I wonder if this is something that I could play, right? You're like, I wonder if this is fun. So you, you found a deck and you like, you made it your own. Yeah. That was my first net deck of two. And, and now I only about. build pretty much decks with that have combos in them. Yeah. Um, it's my favorite way to play. And I don't think I ever would have figured that out if I would have n- not built that first yeah, combo deck. Just like, I think both of you brought up a great point. They just, nothing just lets you play a play style that you don't know how to play or just get into stuff that you don't know how to make. So the only negative that I wholeheartedly agree with that we have on this list is uh, forcing metas or sideboards, which, you know, that's where you can run into problems. If someone net decks with, you know, their meta in mind and you find that they are playing this competitive, uh, you know, combo centric thing, and then you run into a whole, uh, your meta and they don't have a lot of these tricks that, you know, this net deck was playing against, then you have a bunch of answers for things that may not come up as often. Um, yeah, I think- and so you may have to adjust thereafter to fit kind of the things that are going on in your play group. Right. And when I added the idea that net decking kind of forces metas or specific sideboards, it was in the idea that your play group is, I mean, obviously you have like your local play group or whatever, the guys that you play with often for us, it's our EDH group, but also like your LGS or wherever you play the most often is also part of your play group. Uh, and if people are relying on top decks, and especially if they actually learn to pilot them, then it kind of forces everyone else to answer them, either in their sideboard and in their main board. And that's where I really see that net deck has some kind of detriment. Like I honestly think that if somebody's net decking, and I think, Sean, because of, like, literally because you uh, got the deck that you had, like, it had combo that was fast, and that all of a sudden, we had to change our decks to match you. Like, that was something that I think it made all of us a better player because we had, like, a, a peak as it were, and we had to match that. Yeah, I guess that can be viewed as a negative, but I think it can also be a positive because it yeah. makes everybody that wants to play with you, that wants to play in that group, become a better player. You have to be good to play with these decks. Yeah, I think a lot of the other combos that we've had in other decks are like three or four piece combos, but Sean, your deck just has two com- or two card infinite kill combos, and it's just like you got to always be on your toes looking out for that. Uh, and I think, like I was saying, I'm talking about uh, like playing at your LGS or something like that. The the biggest problem with this specific topic is that it becomes especially apparent that there's a problem when a format becomes solved. Like after a new set comes out and you're looking at standard things like that, uh, like if Mono Red's just the best deck and everyone's just net decking and just like looking at what top aided, you know, what won the Pro Tour, whatever it happens to be, and it's all of a sudden you see, you know, sixty percent. Like if a deck is ever more than like thirty or forty percent of a meta that's a problem to me that's a problem yeah i think but i don't think that's a problem of the builders i i think that's a problem of agreed, agreed. The format. I, yeah it's just that's where you know you start to see problems that's where you start to see like bands and things like that yeah. and that's where like the i think frustration comes in is that people are able to pilot a deck uh with no effort on their part i mean i'm not going to say that it's legitimately no effort but it's just compared to someone who spent hours and hours brewing to make their own deck, to try and get it to work, to finesse, you know, the the tiniest synergy or whatever it happens to be. And then someone just comes in, reads the list online, copies it, buys the deck, plays it, and is able to just win because it's just, you know, the formats become solved. I think that's where the problem comes in. And it's kind of like the very same argument as, you know, not being able to express personality or that net decking lacks creativity. And I will say that, yes, net decking doesn't have the most creative aspect to it. But the idea that you can make it your own is something that we'll talk about. And I think that's 
the good part about it. Yeah, I think one of the best recent examples is just Hogak in Modern. Yeah. Like, it was just so consistent and so good that you either played Hogak or you lost to Hogak. You either played Hogak or you played the deck that could beat Hogak deck. Yeah, and so that's why they had to ban... Basically, they just had to take part the the modern Hogak deck. I was going to say, didn't they ban Hogak good. and the Enabler, too? Yeah, yeah, the Battle Under the Bridge or something. Yeah, some weird... They banned both. Yeah, so oh, yeah. I guess they banned I guess that I, one. They banned the bridge card to try and to oh, did they tame first. They yeah, banned they tried was like, to okay, we're gonna try and take Hogak down, and then it didn't work because Hogak was still guys. winning. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> just get rid of Hogak. Yeah, if you take a a deck like Dredge that's already performing really well, and then you add in a card that matches the colors, does all of the things that it wants to do, and then more, then yeah, you're gonna see Kinda a problem. For it. Yeah. But see, so yeah, I totally agree with that. Solving a meta is just that's when things go downhill for all the players, which I think, I mean, generalized statement, that's why a lot of people like EDH with it non-rotating. You have, yeah. you can't so, you can't solve EDH. Yeah, you can't just, once a, a deck list has been solved, you, can, you have to wait for the next set to be like, okay, I need some answers yeah. for this deck to come out. Until then, I'm just going to lose to it. But also, it's a singleton format, so like, you know, you've got tutors and things like that to make your deck more reliable. It's like, okay, you can start to answer them in very specific ways. Add more removal, add more, you know, specific answers. And then also just the variance of a hundred card format. So talking about competitive things like that. So Sean, what are some of the like more competitive side of things, the the pros that you see in that decking? I think a big pro is just the fact that if you're newer, you can actually be competitive without knowing ten thousand cards. It makes it so like knowledge is less of an issue because that is the hardest part about starting to play especially in eternal format is you have so many cards that you just don't know what's actually good or what you actually want to play yeah and there might be just weird cards that you would have never just known about that I still nobody find ever plays weird ass cards that yeah I'm just like how have i never heard of this, this is so good <laughs> but there's just one deck that maybe runs it and other ones that don't even bother yeah. i think another really good positive especially in the more competitive realm is that playing a competitive deck list teaches you how to play really well um or at least forces you to do that you know me and sean both we've told the story on this podcast several times we grew up in just jank town you know what i mean like we had a whole bunch of cards that were unstructured we had quote-unquote standard or modern decks that were 150 180 cards uh you didn't learn how to play really good magic that way you know what i mean you played good cards you played what was in your hand and that's how you played but if you play a really highly tuned list that knows exactly what to do and has xyz decisions you need to make in a game you are forced to think it through you have no other options you have to play well and so by piloting those decks you kind of learn how these professional players play um, and i think that can only help you become a better magic player right so as gary's kind of talking about here you start to learn especially if you know it you just copy and paste it uh you learn what a top tier deck looks like um so you learn what's required for deck to be competitive at higher levels of play uh you start to see like specific uh creatures answers removal things like that that are consistent throughout decks and you start to uh learn what's powerful in the format that you're looking at and why it's powerful especially if you watch like streamers and things like that and you start to see why they're making choices that they are so let's also look at the non-competitive side of things Right, we're not looking at like top tier decks. We're just talking about finding a deck online that you can play. You can get the deck list. Sean, so, let's start with you. I mean, we don't play like super competitive stuff. I mean, you've played at the shop, obviously, but what are your takes on the non competitive side of things? I think the best part, personally, um, about net decking is being able to find a, a way that you want to play the game and then have a base so you can expand on it. Neither of my net decks are net decks now. Um, so you can build this deck, play it, learn it, and then say, okay, I actually want to do this with it instead, or this is the way I actually want to go about doing this. It gives you the perspective on the cards, especially like the, the archetype that you're playing as well, uh, allows you to find what you don't like, what you do like, and then kind of enhance what you do like, cut what you don't like and, and really like chain off of that. Yeah. I think one way to look at this is sort of like the commander pre-cons you say, I'm going to buy this deck list and then this does these certain things, but I'm going to take this part of it out and put this thing in to help me do 
this certain strategy. Yeah, I actually think that's a really good point. Um, I think it's exactly the same. Uh, and if you enjoy commander precons, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't enjoy net decking. Because- yeah, that's actually a perspective that I don't think I had, even when, like trying to get this episode together, was that commander precons, like, yeah, it's a, it's a Watsi product. It's not net decking, but like literally is put together yeah. by professionals to be a deck that works and is synergistic. Thousands of people are literally just buying the exact same hundred cards. As right. You. <laughs> yeah. So I think also, like, if you're looking at EDH and if you're like copying a deck that is one of the lists from EDH Rec or something like that, and you're actually copying a list, uh, or I don't know, maybe you're looking at the decks from Command Zone that's been played, you start to learn, or at least what's generally accepted out of a deck from the specific format, right? Like if you look at EDH, we've got ramp and card draw, those are things that you need to have, and you learn, okay, these are good here because of this, this is not good because of such and such. Uh, you start to ask the questions, why isn't that there? Uh, and I think the biggest boon in all formats, competitive or non, is that you don't have to build a deck from scratch, right? Making cuts sucks. Like we've all been there. It's it's hard, right? And so you don't have to compile a list of cards, then make cuts, make hard decisions. You have a deck and you can go from there. Um, and I think the, along that similar line is that you're able to put a deck together very quickly. Like, Sean, uh, you got the... The one that we're going to talk about is the Niv-Mizzet Perrin deck. You got it from Wedge, from the Mana Source. Uh, you built it literally like the next day, right? And then you started playing that same day. Well, I mean, he literally on the video has a link that goes straight to TCG Player, and all you do is press buy. Well, that is Hell the most yeah. convenient thing I've <laughs> ever heard. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, uh, I think another important thing is that, Sean, when you bought the deck, it was literally just a $25 net deck. Yeah, yeah it was, I literally, I saw it. And I said, that, wow, that's cheap. I can buy that right now. Okay. And yeah. I just did it. Like, yeah, that's like the, the last point I have here is that you can find budget builds that actually work, right? Like I, I'm a budget player, but usually I, I like, you know, bring the cost to about $100. If you pay a dollar per, per card, uh, that I'm pretty happy if, if that's where you're at. But you found a $25 deck that wasn't complete garbage. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh I watched the video. He, a wedge is very persuasive. <laughs> Shout out! <laughs> but uh, it just looked like a fun deck, and I never really played is it before. So I just on the spot was. Just and like, the other yeah, thing let's is, try that, like, it. So you watched it on YouTube, right? Yeah. So just from there, you've got like other players and people who comment on it, like, oh, you should switch this out for this, and like you literally have just like, hey, you can upgrade this deck right here, and like you can make those decisions, or you can like do it later, go back. You have you have another resource basically. That's not just your player. You have other people who are commenting and things like that to really help you tune the deck. Yeah, and so just leading into the next topic, Sean, you bought the deck, and then we I think we play tested it once or twice, and then you're like, no, this deck is not good enough for our meta, and then you immediately started upgrading it. Yeah, that's the thing. Is It actually isn't the worst deck, but our meta is to the point where it was. I was playing my commander while everybody else was winning, pretty much. So... Speaking of which, you, who is your commander? My commander is Niv Mizzet Perun. So Niv Mizzet Perun is blue, 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 red, red, red. So six mana, all colored for a five-five legendary creature, dragon wizard. This spell can't be countered. Has flying, and whenever you draw a card, Niv Mizzet Perun deals one damage to any target, and has just a little kicker on top. Whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, you draw a card. So instant sorceries. Very powerful in Commander, likely going to be played. Not just by you, but by everyone else. So what is the the general idea of, uh, of the deck that Wedge was talking about? So with Wedge's deck, it was more Spell Slinger. You are playing a lot of things that made tokens when you played spells or did damage when you played spells. Uh, so you're playing things like Tauron, Sky Summoner, which... Uh, creates drakes every time you cast an instant or sorcery young pyromancer uh, young pyromancer you're playing gutter snipe so every time you play sorcery or an instant you're dealing too damage to everyone um so more of a heavy focus on you playing spells not just capitalizing off your opponents yeah yeah it was all about you playing spells and then trying to get a big board eventually with tokens and winning or like Playing things like Swarm Intelligence and start copying your spells, so you know your deal four damage all of a sudden does eight, or your draw two do- draws you four. So when you first bought the deck list, were all three of the Niv Mizzets 
in they, the deck, or did you put those in? Yeah, they actually were, because all of them were very cheap. They basically all do the same thing. They care about drawing cards and doing damage and stuff like that. Yeah, I think niv it pair pairs with one of the other ones. and I don't think it's infinite, but it, it certainly goes off real quick with them. So you have a bunch of six-mana dragons, care about drawing cards, pinging. Uh, what would you say are your, like top five changes to the deck maybe not top five but just like the ones that are notable that you're like proud of or that you the way how did you make the deck yours what are the the cards that you put in so i think the important thing is i immediately decided that i wanted to turn it into a combo deck and as soon as i did that i had to get the niv mizzic combo pieces which are tandem lookout curiosity and ophidian eye so what are those cards what do they do okay one of them is a creature with soul bond uh, which is Tandem Lookout. Uh, the other two are enchantments. So Tandem Lookout is a 2-1 human scout for two and a blue. It has Soul Bond, which means uh, you can pair it as either Tandem Lookout or the other creature enters the battlefield, and they remain paired for as long as you control both of them. And his Soul Bond says as long as they are paired, each of those creatures has whenever this creature deals damage to opponent, draw a card. So what's the mana cost on it? Mana cost is two and a blue. Two and a blue. So you can get this out and then wait for Nib to come out and then soul bond them. Yeah, yeah. You can have it chilling for sure. And that's probably what you want to be doing because you kind of want to be pretty close to winning by the time you're playing Nib Mizzet because he'll die. Everybody kills him. Yes. At least he can't will. be countered. That's true, but he still dies. <laughs> I promise. Yeah, I played this deck a couple <laughs> times and I've never played Nib. I think I've played it three or four times. I've literally never been able to play Nib. The mana cost, at least you, you've upgraded. But I think you upgraded after I played it. Yeah, which that was definitely a side note upgrade is yeah, playing yeah. as many multicolored lands. And that's, that's and one of the things that I've got noted here. But you also said Curiosity, uh, which is just one blue mana for Enchantment Aura. Enchant creature, when Enchanted Creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. So as soon as you draw a card, Niv deals damage, which lets you draw a card because of Niv. And then you draw a card, you've dealt damage. Like It just cycles. Another card you mentioned was Ophidian Eye, which is another enchantment aura. It's two and a blue. It has flash, which is very important. And it says, whenever enchanted creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. So I mentioned earlier about the two card combos that Sean put in this deck. And so whenever I play against this deck, I'm like, I'm just waiting for him to come out. So Anytime I, you I, see any of these cards. I have to sort of just keep removal just for these guys or else I'm just going to lose. Yeah. So... With these combos, it seems like a pretty good way to mill yourself out. So I expect you've got some some way to protect yourself there. Yeah, I definitely run Lab Man, which is Laboratory Maniac. Uh, Sean's good buddy. Two and a blue, 2-2 two, two Human Wizard, and it just says if you would draw a card with uh, no cards in your library, you win instead of lose. So I think this is one of the more unique win cons in Magic, but it's Except also one of the most... It basically. <laughs> It's also one of the most common ones because infinite draw combos are really easy to do. But a lot of... I don't think there's any other cards in Magic that let you win from having no cards. A lot of them just do damage or let you do other crazy stuff. But this is the one Yeah, they've exception. got Lab Man and then the new Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. Oh, I yeah, I forgot about the Jace. The Lab Man yeah. Jace that everyone just calls Lab Man Jace. If it doesn't tell you what the, what the strategy is there, then... Yeah, it's just this effect. It's just a backup. It's just a really good backup. And most blue decks that want to just draw a lot of cards so one last card here you have is locust god so the locust god is four blue red for legendary creature god it's a four four it has flying and whenever you draw a card create a one one blue and red insect creature token with flying and haste has two blue red draw a card then discard a card and when the locust god dies return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step so built-in recursion you're drawing a ton of cards in this deck you get flyers with haste I would have to say one of your top additions. Yeah, I think the important thing is if you don't have Lab Man out, but you do have the Locust God out, and you have, say, a Fidian Eye, which says you may draw a card every time it deals damage, you can have him out, start shooting people with Niv Mizzet, probably kill at least one of your opponents, if not two of them, and then before you mill yourself out and die, you just stop, and you have like 80 hasty insect boys that are going to kill the other one and it's just another way to insta win pretty much as well as even if you don't have your combo piece out and you're just drawing a bunch of cards you're still gonna have blockers to live long enough to get your combo 
or realistically, you might just have enough flyers to eventually win the game. That's the thing. When you play a deck and you draw your whole deck and you're looking for a combo piece, you're probably going to draw your combo piece. So if you don't win that turn, you're going to win the next turn. All right. So what are the the highlights? Uh, like what are, I mean, we already talked about specific cards. So what about specific plays that you want to make out of the deck, the strategies? So the main one is pretty obvious. It is self mill. If you have lab man in the deck, it's probably your win con. Yeah. Your primary so, win con. So the main thing I'm doing in this deck is definitely trying to get the combo pieces out to be able to self-mill myself um, quicker than people can aggro me out. Yeah, and you have a lot of the jumpstart cards as well, which care about discarding cards and things in your graveyard and stuff like that, which I think are really good. Yeah, there definitely are some like kind of interesting side characters, like say Crackling Drake, which cares about instant sorceries in your graveyard and exile. And Hey man, uh... 30 power, 4 toughness creature for 4 that also just gets you that extra card. TMTs. So you mentioned that Wedge also had the token generation, which you kept around for the most part. Like, obviously, Locust God j- just makes a ton of tokens. Uh, you've got Young Pyromancer, Talrand. So it's not like you cut through all of that. Yeah, and honestly, I plan on cutting through all that eventually because I plan on making this just a 100% combo deck, but it's kind of in a transition period where I wanted to keep the things that I can still actually get real value from um, without having maybe quite so many instances and sorceries because I'm not playing quite as many anymore. So I'm still going to get incidental value with things like, uh, like Young Pyromancer, but I felt like that's getting a new creature is maybe more worth it than Gutter Snipe and just dealing two damage. So... Um, I'm kind of in the middle with that right now, um, but I am keeping it with that theme a little bit for the time being. And then the last kind of note we have here is that you've got this kind of burn slash direct damage suite. Yeah, and for sure, that's definitely more of Wedge's deck still showing too. Gotcha. Okay, because when I saw it, I figured that was like, if I can't kill people through Niv-Mizzet and drawing cards, that was like my last straw to like, Burn someone out real quick. Which, the last game I won with this deck, I actually did end up burning someone out. It was terrible. It, it was, was Corey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't remember what we were playing, but it was just a grindy game that we were both down to, if I don't kill you this turn, you're going to kill me next, my next turn. And then he just happened to draw a prophetic bolt and deal me some damage. I dealt him four damage, but I doubled the... I doubled it with a double cast that's what it <laughs> and was, he had yeah. eight life. Uh, <laughs> so that's, yeah, for now that theme is also there. And I think it might be somewhat relevant no matter what, since, uh, I mean, I'm never going to build this full as CDH as possible. So yeah, I, th- I don't think just because Niv is it's so prohibitive on cost that you can necessarily build just straight CDH. Yeah. But I just mean like, I'm not going to build as top tier as it can yeah. be like, I'm going to build it good, but I don't have the financial or, you know, I don't have the resources to build it as good as that. So, uh, But you have done a lot of work to upgrade it. Yeah, it's definitely... And to be fair, it's still what I would consider a budget build. Like, when I was looking on deck stats, I think the overall cost of the deck was still sub 100. So, you can take a $25 deck, upgrade it with, you know, another $75, $80, and still keep your, what I would consider a budget build... Absolutely. And me personally, my budget builds are more of the 250 to $300 range. So if I put in another $150 in that deck, I could make it pretty good. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, uh, so some of the, the notable cuts that you've got here, you've removed the slow cards or slower cards, uh, the CMC heavy or the less defined strategy cards. Cause there was a little bit of mill interaction there, uh, just based off of uh, psychic corrosion uh, you draw a card, they mill too. Wasn't exactly what the strategy was you're going for. Uh, you cut Swarm Intelligence. I assume that's because it, it's seven mana. Yeah, I pretty much cut like as much of the high mana cost cards as I could. Rise from the Tide in the same category. Yeah, there. just because, I mean, your Commander six. The other Niv Mizzets, which are probably worth running, also are six. also six. And you don't have much room for any more seven drops in your deck. It's just in our meta, at least. In our meta, we need to be playing a spell pretty much every turn, or else you're probably going to lose. So, yeah. And again, to that effect, you cut down on creatures. Specifically, I noticed that 
the there seemed to be like a correlation between you cutting creatures and you adding artifact ramp. Yeah, I mean you're running. Is it colors red blue? <laughs> there is no real there's, ramp. There's very there's very limited yeah ramp that you have that's directly just red or blue or red and blue. Yeah, so I added as much cheap quote unquote cheap mana rocks possible. I mean I don't think there's a soul ring in wedges version. No, I don't think there is. And, uh, but you cut like erratic cyclops, which whenever you cast instant sorcery, it gets plus x plus o and loses defender, and it's like a an 08 that gets plus X plus O uh, for each, or for the converted mana cost, right? Something like that. Uh, and then you cut Tron Breaker Devils, which does have some, like, graveyard synergies, but I don't think you care about that in this deck. Thermo Alchemist, which, it's a tapper, which uh, we've talked about before, and tappers are great in, like, limited and standard, but they tend to kind of dry out in a format like EDH. Yeah, and uh, I actually, when I first started making changes, I went further into that direction for a, like two games i added a few more tappers and a few more deal damage when you play spells and i just realized that's not really the strategy i want to play pretty quickly so what is it that you decided to prioritize um i really focused more than anything on there's two things uh getting three blue and three red mana because that was my biggest struggle is you know it's turn seven and i have four islands and two mountains what are you gonna do you still are not playing your commander that's what you're gonna do yeah i can (laughs) attest to the times i've played that deck is that you're always you always have one mana off or just like you have way more investment into one mana you literally can't do anything about it yeah the mana costs on some of those ravnica cards are just so prohibitively restrictive that you just sometimes even if you have them all game you're just like i just can't cast it yeah for sure so i really focused on i added Every dual mana card I could um, to the deck, like Sulphur Falls, Spire Bluff Canal, uh, Temple of Epiphany, um, pretty much most of them except for the Fetch Land. Fetch Land and Dual Lands are like the oh, two geez. things you Oh, get. yeah. Definitely not the Dual Land either. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the Dual Land is worth, I think, almost twice what your deck is, if not more. Do you have a Shock Land in there? No, I don't have Steve Vincent yet because that one's still in standard and it's like twenty dollars. So I was yeah. just like, yeah, I'm good for now. Yeah. Just give um, a couple. But then yeah, you also ramp. added uh, more ramp, which unfortunately is largely color colorless. Uh, but you're basically using all of the normal artifact ramp that is in your colors. At least that is budget friendly because like you could use the one from Ice Age or whatever that adds blue. It's like two mana or something like that. But it's like a ten dollar card. And yeah, I don't think that that's what you're adding to the deck. Yeah, I pretty much added all the. Is it artifacts i can get especially once modern horizons came out i got the oh yeah you got the talisman talisman in there and uh which that i i personally just a little side note i think talismans are 10 out of 10 oh yeah yeah, 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 i literally put them in every deck that i can now you got a mana vault or a mana crypt in there bro no 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 yeah (laughs) that's worth a third of this deck (laughs) that's where that extra 200 dollars for my budget comes in (laughs) yeah (laughs) on one card (laughs) so i focused on like i said cheap but not the cheapest like soul ring of course um try to make it a little more efficient a little bit faster because really our meta is it's starting to pick up it's to the point where i mean turn eight you're looking at someone's trying to win so if you're only playing your commander on turn six you're so far behind already it's just probably not going to happen um and then the other thing i focused on is pretty obvious combos we may or may not have talked about (laughs) fitty and i curiosity lab man already uh I think because of our meta, you also added uh, more and better removal, but also counter spells. Because that's, I mean, if you're playing these spells, you care about instant sorceries, that's going to be your go to. Yeah, I definitely added a couple more counter spells, like counter flux, which is the is it uh, counter spell from Ravnica. But then you also added just some like normal removal as well. You've got Chaos Warp in there, which everyone knows. Yeah, so I added Chaos Warp and uh, like Blasphemous Act. Yeah, I think you added two, maybe maybe three board wipes in there. Uh, Blasphemous Act, I think it's like one of the better ones that you added for sure. Yeah, I think I think you threw Evacuation in because that's since, actually in my box right now. I'm I'm waiting to trade it out because okay. I because oh, gotcha. I, I realized before I you had it when you were doing a token strategy and like this is just screwing yeah. me. Mm-hmm. But now that you've leaned away from the token strategy, it's way better. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, obviously I should add a Cyclonic Rift because yeah, it's just But again, good. like it's it's the money on that. Yeah. Like, and uh and another one I literally bought for the deck is Vandal Blast and then I somehow 
have misplaced it. I have no idea where it is. <laughs> I might it's have gone up in it. price yeah, again. It never made it into a deck <laughs> before <laughs> I couldn't find it anymore. So, All right, uh, so as we're trying to wrap things up here, uh, overall, give us the summary of how you've changed Wedge's $25 deck into your deck. So I think the biggest things I did were uh, dropping the converted mana costs, um, trying to make it a little bit more efficient for, for the meta, and uh, with that, adding more ramp, which is kind of... Yeah, honestly, I think they go hand in hand. The, yeah. You've made this deck like, probably twice as fast as it was. Oh, absolutely. Like, don't get me wrong. If I played that Wedges deck in like a really beginner meta, I think it would have been awesome. But it just was not fast enough. But so, for a $25 deck, I think that's about where it's designed to be, right? Oh, yeah. When people say budget decks, they, there's a, a, Cheaper power than pre-con. Le- a power level that you just know that it goes with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure. just to say cheaper than a precon, I mean, I think it's it honestly was probably better than most precons that we've had. It's definitely at least more better focused. than eighty percent of them. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's much more. I mean, it's as focused as you can get. Almost like it will be as focused as you can get soon. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, make it more consistent. Take out the mill. I think there's like two or three mill cards that I saw on his list versus yours. Uh, you said you're taking up tokens, right? Just to make it yeah more I mean, fine tuned. Except for the locust god, because that's just a win condition. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna try to make it more fine tuned towards. Winning the game with my combo pieces, gotcha. um, but so like adding tutors and things like that eventually. Potentially, I mean, there's not too many tutors you can get that helps this. And is it? But definitely a gamble. You know, everybody hates on gamble. It's oh, gamble. we love awesome. gamble here. Best. Gamble is awesome. Um, and then obviously you added your combo. That's really what you're trying to focus down on. It's the reason why you've cut out other things. And you still managed to keep this deck under a hundred dollars. I'm gonna give you like four and a half, maybe four point eight stars on this, just because you took. A net deck. You made it your own. You still kept it budget. Like anyone on here, I think can appreciate that. That the fact that you've tuned it up in I think a significant way to make it more consistent, more reliable. Like Niv Miz is always going to be hard to cast. That's something that you can't really get around. But I think that you've done about as much as you can while keeping it under hundred dollars. Yeah, for it's definitely my cheapest deck, and it's can now hang with my more expensive decks a little bit better for sure. Yeah, before we something we like to do a lot is just commander roulette where we just put all of our decks in the middle and roll Love some it. dice and whoever ended up getting the niv mizzet deck was just a sad boy <laughs> the whole game because <laughs> it just couldn't compete and but now but now, now really it's like if you get niv mizzet you're just like oh y- god you have the the only reason you might be sad is because you know you're gonna get targeted <laughs> yeah as soon as you play niv mizzet the oh, first yeah, time as soon as you play niv mizzet i'm gonna kill it so fast <laughs> So I think, Sean, you did the epitome of what we talk about, especially when it comes to pre-cons. They're just like buying a cheaper deck that is a little less focused than you want it to be, choosing a strategy or direction that you want, and then... Has good bones. Cutting cards that you like, but not necessarily fit in the deck, and then upgrading ramp and card draw and just these categories that make it more focused and more just a cohesive and better tuned deck i'm glad with a zombie which was my first net deck we never actually said that was a zombie lady of scrolls we've oh, talked about it oh, before the, don't the people know it's, a zombie. <laughs> it's up and, there with cranko yeah and uh and then this it taught me how to play the game that i wanted to play and now i haven't even thought about net decking since because both of these decks were about a year ago or so maybe a little less for nim is it but uh now i've exclusively build my decks without doing it because I already know what I kind of like and so now I kind of I'm in the right direction already like I just built Yarok recently when it came out a few months ago and I used EDH rec because I just think it's a smart thing to do but I it's a great resource I just I didn't feel like I needed to google how someone else did the combos I just looked at the cards and I said okay this is how I want to build this deck how I can make it combo-y and also more fun if we don't feel like going combo central on a a game it really quick before we wrap up here I think it's important to note that this idea of net decking, even if you're staunchly against it, even if you think creatively the game of magic was not meant for that, that's fine. I think you should reserve your opinion. I think we as a magic community should do better to reserve that opinion for 
your own playgroup, your own friends or professionals that you know can handle that kind of critique. Because to tell a new player, no, you have to build your own deck. You have to look through 18,000 cards and you have to make the best choices right now or you're not a magic player. Well, I think you're also, not going to have new magic players. Yeah, for sure. Especially with our playgroup, we made a lot of bad decks <laughs> yeah. and wasted a lot of money, like you guys are saying, just buying just cards just to have cards it's and not to try it wasn't fun. <laughs> to make them work and but yeah that was a great it, learning it experience yeah, and that's but, the reason we're here but like we looking fell in back love with on it. it it's just like god i wish i had known at the time if you want this card don't you know like crack packs or like buy a whatever they're called the dual decks or anything like for the card go buy the card there's nothing wrong with just buying packs and cracking them but if you're trying to make a deck i think it's okay to just save a little money and just buy the cards that you need. Definitely. And maybe a lot of new people don't know about resources that help you do that. They just think, oh, I'll just go to the magic shop and buy some cards because that's all I have. But there's tons of different places to look and get ideas. You can just talk to people and they'll tell you what they think. Everybody has their own ideas on deck building. And it's never it's never wrong. Yeah, I really think the, the best lesson you can take from net decking is you can learn something different and something new and kind of find who you really are as a magic player. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about the fact that some people are going to hate you for it because well, I think that we need to kind of kill the taboo that is net deck, right? Like you net decking shouldn't be a taboo. I think that people need to kind of come to an understanding that we live in an information age where we have access to the internet because we carry around, you know, a pocket computer that has the internet and it's just like, oh, how much is that card worth? Oh, people play it with this, you know, and it's like, it's just so accessible. So we jumped into our second half here without ever actually going over the beers again. So let's get back to that action. Corey, you start us off. Why don't you come back in with this? So I had the Funkworks Raspberry Provincial Sour Ale Brewed with Raspberries. And I think we mentioned it earlier, but it's a little raspberry at the front and then just mellows out into the ale and it wasn't that much on the sour side only on the smell the nose has like a nice sourness to it but it really is pretty smooth raspberry like right at the front then it just becomes a nice ale yeah you can smell the acid but you don't really taste it and that's okay now that it's i mean we've been talking for an hour now now that it's a little bit flatter i taste a lot more raspberry uh but yeah it's got the really smooth kind of beer notes underneath that's a really good beer. All right, so the one that I am over here crushing, I can't make the same joke twice in a in an episode, huh? I mean, you just did. <laughs> All we I, do is I, I stop do myself every episode, yeah. bro. Uh, I got the Ten Barrel Brewing Company Crush Apricot Sour, and it is the tartest of the bunch. I, I think it's definitely the tartest, but it has this like sourness to it, and then it's apricot, and then my mouth just feels dry. Yeah. So Ten Barrel, they have I think four different flavors in the crush saga and there's yeah, the cucumber the raspberry this apricot and the lemon one which is said to be top tier yeah and so back when sean and i first got, were drinking sours we only knew about the cucumber and the raspberry and then we saw them come out with the apricot and lemon and we immediately had to go out and try them yeah i think this apricot mode might actually be the best of the four honestly yeah i think it, it go i keep going back and forth between the lemon and the apricot cuz they're just they're so refreshing but still really sour like we like them i think that's a note that we didn't put in the beginning is that sours are so drinkable and they're not heavy at all yeah so you can just not. drink them and drink them it's and drink them. very dangerous. Drink. They're incredibly sessionable and crushable, which might be why they called them that. All right. So the Almanac Strawberry Basil Sour Nova still just has that sour nose to it, but it really doesn't taste that sour at all. It's got like some tartness from the, the strawberries, that nice herby basil taste to it. It's real, real good. It definitely smells a lot less spitty after it's been warm. <laughs> and it actually, to, this is the only sour I've ever had that I'm going to say this, but I think it tastes better warm and a little bit less carbonated. What? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we ever talked about, because a lot of European Germans, countries, yeah. they drink their beers warm, which changes the flavors. I, I have to agree with both of you guys. The flavors are definitely more pronounced, but I'm getting... 
like less strawberry and more the basil this time around. Yeah, that's not it's not as sweet. But it's definitely not super tart either, which yeah, is it's still really good. It's pretty good. And then Sean, you've got you black know, sheep. Black I have Yule wine barrel beer. And uh So what is it called? <laughs> wine barrel beer. <laughs> Yule wine barrel. Uh it's the English style barley wine ale from Wasatch Brewery out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Shout Bar- out Ooh. barrel aged in Pinot Noir barrels. Yes, uh it's a hefty one at 10.4% if you forgot. And as it gets warmer, honestly, it's a little, it's a little bit more, uh, like sour is not the right word for this episode, but it's a little bit more like tart and it's very wine, like like red yeah, wine. Yeah. It, it honestly is almost better warm. I think for this one too, which is weird. I never like warm beer, but there's so, two of them today. <laughs> another thing to think about is that especially a barley wine, uh, a barley wine ale and a Pinot Noir like aging process is that wines tend to have a lot more uh, flavor and a lot better characteristics after they've had time to be exposed to the air and to aerate and to open up as they say. And so I think maybe that's what it is with this one is that it's actually had time to open up and get all that wine goodness. Yeah. I'm really bummed to agree. This is better warm. (laughs) Yeah. I got a lot of that figginess is still there, but it's, you get, a lot less alcohol, in my opinion. It's just a lot smoother yeah. and more flavorful. The smell definitely has that figginess still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it just smells but yeah, like it's, it's way better than it was at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> it's less acrid, less a little less of the sort of wine tannins, and yeah. more. It's still that like full, round. I, I don't know how to explain like the rich kind of flavor. I, I think you nailed it with full round. Full and rich. round and rich. There you go. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to That's be. That's how I like my women. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> no comment. So, uh, beer of the show, going around. We're going to end with our guest, Sean. Corey, we're going to start with you. Uh, I think my vote has to go with the Apricot Crush. One, because I love that beer already. And two, it's just the most acidic out of all of these sours. And when I look for a sour, you I want, want the, sour? The, ass, the acid. I want, want the, the burn. Ass? I want, want the acid. <laughs> and it's just, it has that incredibly good refreshing flavor like sean was saying you just drink that all day but it also has that tart acrid just sourness that i just love and i'm addicted to yeah and gary what about you uh during the beginning of the show i was leaning towards the raspberry but i've had other raspberry ales that were more fruit forward and i think i like that better in my raspberry beers i want that fruit to like really punchy in the mouth so i'm, I'm gonna vote apricot sour as well that was a that was one good beer so that's the beer i like the least i kind of figure probably because it is the most like it has most, the most, sour most like classic sour yeah. tasting yeah so I, i've really been digging on the the strawberry basil sour nova but i think the best one is funk works i mean surprise raspberry is my favorite fruit and it's, so good. it's really, it is really really good, really good. Really good. Uh, but surprise dark horse with the pinot noir barley wine. i'm not really a big fan of barley wines but that aging process they've done, it's real good. And Sean? 100% crush. the crush beer. <laughs> do, do, do. Let's go. <laughs> it's so, just so sour and delicious. I know, right? You it's, can't it, argue with yeah, it. If you like sours, it's definitely a good beer for you. Yeah, be on the lookout for 10 barrels. All of their crush ones are really good. The ones that you can usually find in the stores, at least around here, are the cucumber and the raspberries. But we got to go to 10 barrel and see if we can get like one of those 12ers that has three each, you know? That's yeah. what I want. Yeah, but if you, if you can find the, the apricot or the lemon, they're much better than the other two, and the other two are already super good. <laughs> so if you're ever there, always stop in and try. They always have a weird, different sour that's never in a can there. Highly recommend stopping there. Yeah, they do a lot of cool seasonal beers, too, that they never package. They're only there on tap. So I guess, reluctantly, beer of the show goes to the Crush. 10 Burberry Crush. Apricot sour. I mean, realistically, this is a sour episode, so the most sour, you know, it kind of makes I sense. I guess, yeah. If, if that's where you're leaning, lean hard. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. just a little celebration for us here. Uh, this is episode 26, and so this episode marks six months of our episode releases for the podcast, which is kind of cool for us anyways. Whoop, whoop. 
We're hey, so- you know what? I, I want to shout out the, the, the fans of the show because in the last few months, we've gotten a lot more followers, a lot more engagement. We've actually got people commenting on the videos. Yeah, you know what? It's- people actually come in and say, hey, I like what you're doing, which is great to, yeah, to hear. It, it but really like helps us out. Actually, seeing that validation makes it a lot more worth it. I was going to say, because we can see the views, you know, someone watches the podcast, that's great. And we're really excited about it. But, but, but the, the comments and the interaction, seeing real people like really enjoying magic and seeing everybody's take on it. That's, that's tier one. That's what we really like. So keep them coming. Uh, I think that's a good wrap though. I think we, we kind of crushed through all of these sours. Obviously 10 barrel. How many gets times the- are you going to try and use the same <laughs> pun? <laughs> Obviously 10 barrel gets the cake. So I literally don't think we could have done this episode or gotten it together if it weren't for Sean uh, the first person in our play group to bring in net decking and to kind of just shut down the stereotype that is like the negative aspect of net decking I think that none of us would be here without Sean because Drew and I got into beers together and then Sean's one that got me into magic and then we roped Drew into coming to play magic with us, and then all of us just fell back in love with it. And then, Gary, and you'd, you'd been out of magic for a while. And but because then, your brother was playing. But was just consistent. all of us just came back just to share our love of magic and of beer. Yeah, I was going to say, our play group is literally like, we go, we get awesome beers, we share beers, we you know have a couple games, we enjoy it. I, there's a reason why we talk about Sean almost every episode. <laughs> it's because... He's just so pivotal. Yeah, the pivotal member of our group. To our play group. And like, we either played at my house or at Sean's house back in the day. That's Those are the only two places we ever played. And we would always just be drinking beers and just having fun. Playing the jankiest <laughs> of oh, just magic. Real bad magic. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, boys. Hopefully this is one of many episodes that you're on. Yeah, to be fair, we did try to get Sean on another episode, but scheduling and just a lot of frustrations not not working out for us. Hopefully, once we start getting video production up, you can see his handsome face, and then we, maybe we can get some gameplay videos. Or just go to Instagram. You'll see a picture of yeah, him. Yeah, and you could see you could probably see his Niv Mizzet deck in action at some point. Oh, you betcha, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you guys want to check us out when we get that video or before, we're always putting up all the cards we talk about on YouTube. We're at Untap Upkeep Drink. You can check us out on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at UUD Podcast. Uh, like I said, we really enjoy the comments. We enjoy the interaction. Even if you want to make it private and send us messages, asking questions, we just like to interact with, with not only our fan base, but just the magic community. And if you are drinking alongside us, make sure you're being responsible. Don't drink and drive. No underage drinking. You guys know the spiel at this point in time. Uh, this is episode three of five for Brewers Week. We got another couple hot ones coming in. The last one is special. At least to me, it's, it's extra special. So look forward to those. We'll see you tomorrow uh, where we're talking about some upgrade action. Yes, but if you guys have any crazy sour beers that you like, just be sure to send them our way. Let us know because I'm always looking for them. I will try them. Doesn't mean I'll like them. I'll drink them all. Oh, yeah. They literally will <laughs> drink them before anyone <laughs> else Sean gets and I, Most of our conversations nowadays are just sending each other pictures of sour beers. <laughs> Shout out to the, uh, the Shades Brewery Tom Ka Sour. Oh, yeah, yeah you're you're so like, about that one. Oh, it's incredible. And make sure you check out Drew's Brews uh, this week. We'll have a total of four different posts uh, today. You should see on there, we've got the sours. Got eight sours that I tried. I roasted my taste buds off for you guys just to give the unadulterated. Uh, okay, let's be honest. It's a little censored, but. <laughs> All right, so thank you guys for hanging out with us. Thank you for listening. Hopefully, you guys cracked a cold one while you're sitting down with us. And as always, have fun, but not too much. And let's party. Yeah!